Well, today's program is Put Kearns. Um, as we all know, she's going to be talking about the history of purses and also the purse collection that we have on display right now that belong to her mom, Mary Lauderdale. And the, what we have on display is just a small part of that collection. We do not have all of them out. I don't have that much space. But we probably have, I think, over 100 out. So, cool. I've already had compliments on a couple of them. One, that one for sure. And then another, Leslie said, she's like, she's seen people, she loves the fact that the beaded purses are larger than what she thought they would be. She's seen only the small ones. So, so yeah. And before we get started, I want to thank this month's sponsors, who are John Yuznaga and Lou King. And um, uh, Hood actually has a background in fashion. Um, she's always been been fascinated by fashion, and at one time wanted to be a fashion designer um, that she actually did for several years. Um, later on, she became a faculty member at Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri where she taught fashion design and costume history, as well as being the curator of the college's reference collection of antique clothing and accessories. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Quinn. Thank you. Um, a little background on how, uh, before we kind of start on, on the actual uh, history of purses, which is, at, which is, in my opinion, it's women's history we're gonna be talking about today because um, it, it's amazing how it traces through that. And I think, you'll, I think you're gonna find this is much more entertaining. This is not gonna be, and this handbag, and this handbag. This is gonna be a lively conversation about women's history um, as represented through what we carry. Uh, but my mom, um, as, we were, as I was visiting with somebody a minute ago, you know, mom, through the years, really had not ever really collected anything. And uh, her mother collected antique glass, her brother collected things, and, was, and it, she, she got to a point where she was kind of like, I need to collect something. <laughs> <laughs> so she had come up to uh, Missouri to visit me, and we had gone to lunch in a cute little antique shop in Jefferson City, Missouri, which was where I lived at the time I was teaching at Stevens College, which was 30 miles up the road in Columbia, Missouri. And we were, it was a cute little shop. We had, you know, and our table was sit, seated right next to a wonderful display case that was full of just all kinds of little bitty treasures. And there was a black velvet bag in there, and it's not, it's not here. It, is, it has become so fragile that it's really, really hard to use because it's over 100 years old, and I mean, silk velvet is just, well, doesn't last. Well, I still have it, but anyway, she looked at that bag and she said, I've always been fascinated with antique purses. I think I'm going to let that one start my collection. So I think it was maybe $35 or $40 and she bought the purse, and it was a wonderful Art Deco purse. Uh, it really was a gem. It is a gem. And that started what became, for, her, for she and my dad, a wonderful journey. And the reason I say my dad is because they traveled a great deal. My mother was involved in the Retail Confectioners International Trade Association. And she literally worked her way up from a board member to becoming, uh, I believe, only the second woman to ever be president of that association. Well, they traveled all over the U.S. and actually, in some cases, even since it was an international organization, they went, they went to some, some places, some other places in the countries particularly at work that had a lot of chocolates and things in them. Well, Mom figured out real quick that she could go up to the concierge in any hotel and say, where is the antique district? Because that was going to give you more interesting shops. She, you know, she didn't want to shop. It wasn't shopping in malls. She wanted those wonderful little entrepreneur-owned <coughs> shops and things. And uh, in a lot of these big cities and where these hotels were near convention centers, she were never going to find that nearby. So but if she got to the antique district, then she, was, she could go around and look. My dad was happy to put her in the antique shops. He was always intrigued with all of it. You were going to have interesting little restaurants. You were just going to have the things you needed to get a feel of the city. So they, they, would, go, they, they would do this, and your mom would walk into an antique shop, and they would say, can, you, can we help you? And she would say, yes, do you have antique purses? And if they did, she saw them. They either added to her collection and she bought them, or she said, you know, those really don't thank you. May we look around? And then they were happy to look at Putter, and it, it was a great life for the two of them, and they thoroughly enjoyed this and this time together, and that's why I say it was mom and dad. 
Over the years, and after, even after my dad was gone, she continued to collect. It got harder and harder because fewer and fewer purses, as she put it, added to her collection. But in the end, when she uh, left us, she had 571 antique purses, which all came to me. Um, and over the years, I have sold some, you know, just to try to, 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 get the, to get some of the collection reduced. I have my hundred I'll never part with. I have boys, it's going to be ugly at that point. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm excited that it's on display because I'm hoping to bring my daughters-in-law out here when they're here for the 4th of July holiday and at least let the girls see some of them so maybe they'll, and, and there's two granddaughters, so maybe they'll get a little bit of appreciation for them. And after we're done here, I'm happy to go out, we'll talk, and we can look at some of them and talk about them, and I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize some of them from the pictures here. Uh, I was telling somebody a minute ago that uh, after Mom was gone, I took all of the purses, piled them all into my car, which was quite a job, and drove to Dallas, and my uh, dear cousin Paul Plunkett, uh, and his wife and mother-in-law let me move into their house for a week with the purses and he set up a camera studio and we cataloged and photographed. Now mother had excellent records but we matched everything up by numbers and then put them in numerical order in the boxes and things and, as, you know, into, the, into a filing system to be able to do anything with them. And so these are the photographs that Paul Plunkett took. So these are beautiful professional level photographs that I've got as we start through this. Um, so that's kind of a little background of, of how and why I have purses. Um, but you know, as we talk about with, with women's history, um, you know, let's face it, is, is there anybody in this room um, among the women guys who, who doesn't have a purse with them? I do. <laughs> <laughs> and there's stuff in there you can't do without. You know? And you know, this is so interesting, you know, we have become we have become quite dependent on that. And yet, you know, that's really a fairly modern phenomenon. Because uh, if we take kind of a look backwards, you know, women didn't start with purses. Men did. <laughs> The first purses were carried by men in the Middle Ages. See, he's got his little purse right here. And um, there were, you know, there, they had names like almoners uh, for, uh, to keep the alms for the poor, uh, budgets. Uh, where the name came from, I'm not particularly, I don't particularly know, but what it, what's interesting is because the purses were called budgets, and those were usually the ones that had money in them, um, that's where the word budget that we use today came from, is it's a descendant of the man's purse. Also, they were called mails, as in a man's travel bag. That got changed, and those were the ones that usually held letters and papers and things. And that got changed into M-A-I-L. Wow. And that's where we got mail from, is, you know, is from that. So all of those things are descended from the man's purse. Now, um, you know, um, the, 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 the men also, um, and I'm, I'll come back to say just a couple of other things about the men and their purses. Um, you know, the, uh, the purses were also used every year at New Year's. Uh, the nobleman presented a gift to the king, and they were done in little drawstring bags that, were, that would have been, that were very much called like a purse. They were required to purchase or create a new purse every year, fill it with money, and give it to the king. And so and those purses were really kind of like gift pack, gift wrap. But that was a, a big use for them. Um, and then it was also very common for ladies to make a purse and give it to a man as a gift. Uh, and I love this, uh, this quote from this man to, it was from Lord Bessero, who turned down a gift purse from Sarah Ponsonley, saying, I desire the favor of you to not send me the purse you mentioned, for I have, I believe, 20 by me that are not of any use. It has been a fashion of ladies to make purses, and they have so obliging have to give me a great many. I guess he, he either was one of those that we would probably call a hunk today. Who knows? Anyway, you know... Um, so the men, were, the men were carrying these, and they also carried tobacco pouches and things like that. And 
My mom uh, does have in her collection a beautiful tobacco pouch that's a little drawstring thing on the top that's white leather that is um, decorated in black ink drawings that's really, really lovely. But it, you know, it's a man's, it's clearly, that's what it's used for, is for the man. But ladies started with pockets. Now remember, we're in a time when women did not own property. They were in a white property. So they, they, they really didn't have much. Now, so the pockets, uh, what you did with this is you tied it around your waist. We were in the days before zippers, so you had big, full skirts. And this is in the, the 1700s. And they all, the skirts all had slits in them. For, you know, first off, for you to get them on and off, because they, they were, again, all drawstring as well. And then, so where these slits were, you tied your pocket underneath it so that the slit here matched up with the slit in the skirt. Mm -hmm. So you could put in there a few little things. Mm -hmm. They started out, and, and, and of course, the poorer you were, the pl they were plain muslin. And then later on, they became more and more elaborate. Now, these two are not from Mom's collection. These are two that I had to find, because these are very extremely rare to be able to get. These are in museums and things. But you can see how they became very, very elaborate and everything. Um, and um, the, the pot, there was one uh, New England lady who left in her will the contents of her pocket to a good friend. <laughs> That's all she had to leave for her. The, po the, 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 the pocket contained a pocket glass, a comforter, and a strong water bottle. Yeah, what are those? Right? I see all these. Huh? What is that one? Pocket glass was a small mirror. The comforter was a hand warmer. And the strong water container either held rum or some other strong liquor. Like a lot of Yes. So anyway, so the, the pockets, you know, you can see again how these full dresses would have done this. And so this is, you know, during the time of Marie Antoinette and Martha Washington, then you got, you, this is kind of when they reached... Um, you know, the extremes of all those elaborate things that you saw a minute, you know, a little bit earlier. So, you know, this is all well and good until we hit uh, the early 1800s, um, which um, is in particular in France, after the French Revolution, they have, not only do they have a revolution, they have a revolution in fashion, and it becomes one of those things where they want n to look nothing like this. Whoops. So this is what you go to. Let me go back. There we go. All right. One more. There we go. This is what they went to. Um, if any of you have seen uh, Bridgerton or Sanditon on TV recently, um, both of those shows are set in what's called the Regency era. And if you if you remember, the dresses are all what they call empire waist, and that was that was called that after the empire of Napoleon. And you'll see here, you know, it's very high waist. Very straight, and both of these, these are also made out of really thin fabrics. Their muslins are very, very thin silks, you know, they, and in, in the extreme fashion, they would even talk about the fact in order to make them look clingy and like Greek gowns, they would actually have someone mist them or wet them so that they would cling to you, almost, I think, wet t-shirt back in the <laughs> And since we're carrying them on the outside, 
um, we can now decorate them a little bit. We can make them a little more elaborate. So that's what we're doing here. And um, you know, they're, they're all, um, beadwork begins to become popular. And in fact, this one here, this was an engagement purse. And you've got his initials on one side and her initials on the other. And this would have been a gift that a man would have given a woman as an engagement thing. This one, Mom always felt like that the, the actual original drawstring wore off. And so they added the piece of silk up here to make the drawstring because probably the purse would have stopped here on that one. But again, you can see, and what's interesting is most of these are either knit or crocheted. We always think that, you know, are the beads sewn on individually onto a cloth base? No, they are not. They are actually strung on thread and either knitted or crocheted into, and when we get out there in a minute, I'll show you some of those kind of things. Um, so, you, you know, so you see that, but you begin to start to see all this elaborate stuff. Now, in the beginning, most of them actually come to a simple point at the bottom and you've got some fringe. You know, just a, or a little tassel. Of, this is a beaded tassel. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, again, the very basics of all of this as it starts out. But a reticule became something that was used, and this is a, these are fashion illustrations of the time, and again, you can see in, in, the, in every one of them, she's carrying a purse. So the women were encouraged to start making them, and this became a craft sort of thing, just as embroidery and all of those things women could do. So you had a number of uh, magazines and books and things that would have patterns for purses, and you can see the variety of things here. Now, part of those instructions would include, as I mentioned, you know, you're gonna you're gonna put the the beads and things on them. So we're gonna back up a second. Every single row of this, you've got to string the beads ahead of time. So you've got to count. And they would have instructions for this row. This is going to be your pattern of this many white beads, this many blue beads, this many green beads, this many white beads, this many blue beads. This. So you've got a long string of beads. And with every stitch, you pull a bead in, crochet it in, pull a bead in, crochet it in. These purses could take weeks or years to make. I just just about finished, I've got this much left to go, on a needlepoint stocking for my grandson, Janine, who's been watching me do it. And it's taken me nine months to do that, just one stitch at a time with no beads. That's what we're looking at for these kind of things, because these beads on some these are tiny, tiny, tiny beads. Um, so, uh, and, and most of the beads at this, in this era were made of Venetian glass. The Venetians figured out how to make the glass. They would take a glob of it, put an air bubble in the middle of it, and then have somebody walk 100 feet carrying this hot glass, and it would get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And then they would let it cool and then snap it into about one yard lengths, and then from there make them smaller, and then they could polish them to make the beads. Most of them were made on the island of Murano. Uh, and so that was, you know, and, and when we get, again, I can show you that how, how tiny, tiny they were. They're even smaller than what we think of our beads today. So it was, you know, quite, quite fine work. So that's, you know, again, you're seeing that here. Now, the miser's purses were also popular at the time. Women didn't have a lot to carry, no matter what. I mean, when you're still talking about smelling salts and just a very, very few things. But these purses were called miser's purses, and they were used, and in particular in churches where it was dark. And by the way, remember, all you've got at this time, of, you, where there's no electricity, we're, look, we're talking about the only time you could make these was pretty much daytime. Because at night, it was too dark to see. Even with candles, you just couldn't do it. So, you, you know, <laughs> these, this is, these were a lot of work. But these purses, what you've got is it's a long crocheted tube. In some cases they're beaded, uh, some cases they're maybe a little bit more plain. And if you notice, this end is wide, this end is narrow. This has a single tassel, this has a wide piece of fringe at the bottom. Same over here, single tassel, wide piece of fringe. You put your pennies in here, you put your larger coins in there. The two rings at the top spread apart and there is a slit right here where you can put your money in and then you close it up and you can put that on your finger 
carry. So that's how they did it. Or you could you could put it you, know, you could put it in your reticule or whatever you wanted to do. Now why did why did that matter? Because the churches were dark, and you wanted to be sure you gave the right amount of money. <laughs> you might not be able to see or feel. So you put the you put the money in the two different sides, and then in the dark. This is the wide one, okay, this is the skinny one, depending on what your level of generosity was and what you were doing. So uh, these were very, very popular in the era, and they actually continued on through, just because they later just kind of becoming little coin purses. Um, you know, the, the, again, the, uh, we're getting into a little bit later in the 1800s. You notice now we've gone away, frankly, finally from the empire waste, and we're starting down back into some fuller skirts. We haven't gotten all the way into the big hoop skirts yet. But we're seeing that. But by this point, when the when purses are on the outside, we're carrying them. We're now a generation into purses. And so women are carrying them. But they're still, this purse is still only about this big. Because that's all you needed. You weren't carrying much more than that. So you really didn't need much more than that. So these are, again, some examples of some of the, the purses and how elaborate the, the work would be on them. This one actually has, this is like needlepoint in the center and then all the beadwork around it. Uh, some of these become fairly hard to date <coughs> because you, there's, there is a range in here where the reticule was such a common purse. Some of it you can look at the artwork and say, okay, this would be, you know, looking at the artistic style, you could do that. But actually all of these purses here are probably from 1840 to 1860. They may look, you know, this design in particular to me almost looks more Art Deco. And looking back here, those colors do not look of that era to me. They look much more modern, several like that. So, but these are, you know, we know we know the knew the age of these. So, Goldie Lady's book was a popular source of design. Goldie Lady's book was the book of the era that told women to get. It was it came once a month, and then you could eventually get them in bound volumes. It would have some fashion in it, it would have some crafts in it, it would have some recipes in it, it would have household tips, it would have short stories, or in some cases, serialized stories that people could read from month to month to month. So Goatee Ladies Book was an enormously popular book at the time. Of course, the illustrations were mostly black and white, but you do see in some cases where they would have been hand-colored uh, for the very for the wealthy, so you could you know get a little bit of style in it. And there was a, a time when it was very popular to just frame the illustrations. <coughs> that was one of your main sources for a lot of the purse instructions. Okay, you remember I talked about the cashmere shawls. So now we are probably 30, 40 years past when the when the shawls were first came out and were popular. Well, in, when you're in an era like that, what happens to, to wool? The moths. Moths. So there's a point at which you've still got this beautiful shawl, but you've got chunks of it that may have holes in it. It became extremely popular to redo them into purses. And women, because women were thrifty, they reused things. And the thing also that became very popular at this time was steel beads, or metal beads, from France. And so that's what all these are. This one has just got a, just a gorgeous, gorgeous beading on a jewel frame on it. But these two, they have gone in on the paisley pattern, and these are uh, metal beads that they're covered with to, get, to make it silver. And so that they became extremely popular during this era. So these are, these are both probably 1840, 1850 eras. Those two are. This one may be a little bit later. But that's how they recycled. Oops. Trying to get back this one because this was fun. Sorry, y'all. There we go, finally. Now, another popular accessory in the uh, 1800s was called the chatelaine. And the men started with this 100 years before. And it was a clip that went on your belt with a whole bunch of chains on it that had stuff hanging from it. For the men, it was tools corkscrew, you know, just different things they might need through the day. The women decided, you know, in uh, about the uh, 1870s that these, you know, that this was not a bad idea. But theirs are silver. And theirs are almost like waste jewelry, let's call it that. 
But so you've got this very elaborate clip up here. And then hanging down from it, you've got a little tiny coin purse. And I'm talking this big. This is a case that you would have put your needles in. This is a case that would hold your thimble. You've got a little compact here. You know, these two, it's hard to tell what they are, but I'm sure one of them probably helps smelling salts. Now remember too that you know you, you might need smelling salts for fainting with you know and with the corsets and things that you're lacing in. You might need that. But the other thing to remember is that you know sometimes maybe it wasn't as much smelling salts as something that you needed just to hold up to your nose because people didn't bathe, they didn't wash these clothes, they didn't have deodorant, and sometimes you just needed to do something just to cover up the smell. <laughs> So one of those might have been, one, been that as well. But they had these elaborate things. It's very, very rare to find a full intact chatelaine anymore. I have a necklace that I should have thought to wear it tonight after I got here, when I was looking over things, I was like, oh, I should have worn it. Because I've actually got my grandmother's needle case and her thimble case I'm on a necklace. I've, uh, seen, I've seen you wear it. Yeah, yeah, and so it's up, you know, they're on there. Was was a wonderful way to, to do something with it. Okay, so now, it, you know, as we get to the turn of the century, the clip handbag is invented for the, the closure at the top. So you begin to see that, and, um, you know, uh, women are, you know, they're, 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 the, the handbags are taking a little bit more of a structured look, but they're still not very big. I mean, you look at this purse and you think, oh, that's a nice big purse. No, it's about the size of the one in the picture. It's, it's tiny. It's, it's a sweet little velvet purse that, that mom's got that, that's really, really lovely. But it's really not much bigger than this, which is, which is to me so interesting. But things are about to change in a little bit. But women didn't go anywhere without their purses. And you can see, I mean, here, we have more and more of the fashion illustrations. You begin to see, they're, they're showing a purse in them. But then in some of the photographs of the time, I mean, she's got a purse right here. She's got a purse right here. Let's see, she's carrying one here. So you begin to see ladies carrying their purses. And I still swear she's in her swimsuit with her purse. <laughs> it's, you know, to me, it's just a lot of fun to see all that. Um, <laughs> handbag was just simply part of, of what you did. You know, once again, here you are. They're on the picket line carrying their purses. You know, um, you know just like you know, we always see the queen with her purse. And have any of you, speaking of that, have any of you seen the charming, charming video with the queen having tea with Paddington Bear? Yes. I do, you know, where she talks about what's in the purse. If you haven't seen it, just Google Paddington Bear tea with the queen. It is absolutely delightful. And she actually did it. I mean, I think the fact she had the sense of humor to be able to say, sure, I'll do it. Um, World War I comes along, and of course we had a time, as we do, you know, we had during the, the, the Great Wars, where the men were gone off to fight, leaving the women running things at home. And I can still very, very clearly remember hearing my grandmother talk about those times. Being here at home and being married and my grandfather being off and knowing she had to, you know, run the businesses and keep things going. Um, and so uh, you begin to see uh, the dress change. You begin to see... Um, well, several, and there's for several reasons for this. Number one, remember we're making uniforms for the men. We're, everything that is going on in this country is going toward the effort to keep the soldiers safe, clothed, fed, and getting to the front. So in this country, there was an enormous push for people to um, conserve, to live much, get much scaled down lives, much more practical. That's when all the Victory Gardens started and a whole lot of that kind of thing. We think Victory Gardens may be World War II, they were actually World War I. But the women's clothes become shorter because we can't really have things dragging, dragging around anymore. We gotta get, we've got to get somewhere. We've got to get things done. Purses become leather because it's more durable. Um, and they become a little bit larger. But it's interesting, even then, they're tooled, and they have, you know, many cases, uh, we're in the Art Nouveau era. And so you'll see a lot of Art Nouveau designs on the, on the purses in that era. Uh, and many of these, you know, the, the leather is another one of those things that doesn't hold up very well. After about 100 years, it starts to turn to dust. So, you know, the, there's a few in the collection. You know. 
So after the war, we you know, ushered in a new freedom of style. Finally, we can start to live again. And so you begin to see the 20s. You see the skirts get a lot shorter. And once again, you know, and now again, the women, the women are not quite ready to give up all the freedom. I can remember my grandmother used to talk about the fact that her grandfather came home. I mean, my grandfather came home from the war. And he was like, okay, Gertrude, you know, it's fine. We'll go back to normal. And she's kind of like, no, okay, we're not doing that. Uh, and I can remember there was a fabulous song in the movie um, Ragtime, another movie, the musical Ragtime, where the woman sings, we can never go back to before. And every time I hear that song, I feel like it's my grandmother's anthem. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But, um, you know, so, so the women began to, this is you know, kind of a little mini rebellion, you know. No, we're, we're going to, you know, we're, we're still going to um, uh, show you that we are not going back to all those full skirts in the course, and particularly not the corsets. In the war, the corsets went away because it was practical. We're not going back. <laughs> so here's what happens here. And again, you can see the purses begin to get still larger. And you begin to see Art Deco coming into them. The motifs change as Art Deco comes in. And another purse I've got that's wonderful that's in this era, uh, the other thing that, ex that there was just this explosion of fascination in, during the 1920s, they discovered King Tut's tomb in Egypt. And the Egyptian motif went crazy. And in fact, there's a wonderful building in downtown Greenville, the old Stringer Mortuary, that if you ever go down, it's now, uh, it's on Johnson Street, and it's now a law office. Um, it's across the street from, if you know where, where Holly Gocher, no, Stonewall, you're right, Stonewall. Stonewall. It's across the street from Holly Gocher's office. Um, and there are two Pharaoh heads up on the top of it. And it's, it's this era. Um, and I, there, I've got a couple of wonderful purses. And I, honestly, I haven't looked for them out here to see if they're here that have the Egyptian motif on them that are just amazing. Uh, but you, know, you can see this. We're also beginning to see the, the beginning of metal, metal mesh bags. There was a lot of technology lit, leap forwards um, in World War I. And they were able to apply some of that later to the manufacturing of metal mesh. And these are all little teeny tiny squares of metal that are linked together. So it's, it's, like, it's almost like a chain mail type thing. Uh, except they can now do prints and very elaborate, uh, elaborate, and this is actually printed on a screen or somehow it is actually applied to the surface. And you, again, you can see here on this leather bag how very different it is from those earlier ones. You know, it's, it's got a much more modern feel to it. Um, and then the, fla the flapper fringe that you thought about in the dresses is echoed in the handbags as well, with big loops of beads here. This is so that, you know, it would shape with you as you danced. And these were all bags, these are all, again, crochet, but became solid colors. Th these are stripes, and then the, 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 there's, with each row, they add more beads, and that's how it gets on with this, this flare and ruffle edge on the bottom of them. And again, you've got instructions on how to make all of these. This one I love, and I've got a couple of examples of this, where you actually come up and there is a bracelet. So you just slip that on your wrist. Ooh. And, um, you know, so here again, you know, then as we move to the 30s, you see the uh, inspiration of Hollywood, and the movies begin to come in. And uh, so you're, you've got uh, a little more suits. It's a little sleeker style. You've got, you're highly accessorized. And so you've got uh, the purses there that are a little bit more glamorous and a little more possibly discreet, shall we say. So um, they can look a little bit more like this. There's, and this, this is, I think, a wonderful one. It opens here and actually kind of has a little bit of, of a wedge of fabric on either side to let you get into it. But um, this is brocade then, with beautiful with a beautiful piece of coral carved into the panel. Uh, after, as World War II came along, the skirts continue again to get shorter, and a lot of that is because they needed the fabric for uniforms. So we shortened the skirts for the women so that that was less fabric and more fabric for the men. Fine with the women, as it turned out. But notice how much bigger the purses have gotten. Because now, once again, the women are running things at home. But now we need keys. 
We need a wallet. We maybe need a notebook with our notes in it. Uh, we're, there's, women at this point are smoking. And so you might need your package of cigarettes. Uh, certainly there's cosmetics in the world now. Um, you know, those have come along, so you need your lipstick. We're not all to the point of the cosmetic bags with the lipstick and the mascara and the blush and the powder like one of, you know, pick the young women do today. But you certainly weren't going anywhere with that lipstick. So the bags got bigger, and you see that. But they're not as elaborate. They're more uh, along the, you know, the, the leather has now really replaced the beads as the style for women. It's a lot more practical. I mean, this is just <laughs> I'm just going to let that one sit up there a minute and let y'all just take it in. <laughs> That's my grandmother, y'all. <laughs> and by the 1950s, you know, the movies again, and, and our movie, our, you know, our, our princesses, if you want to call them that, of the day, and their styles. And of course, these three are elegant and uh, distinctive in their styles. Grace Kelly, um, uh, Marilyn Monroe, and Audrey Hepburn. And there's the styles in the bags. Alligator bags were the rage. Um, straw bags, you know, a, a pretty stylish straw bag, and those are just elegant, beautiful bags. But you bought, you bought them and you carried them, and you took care of them, and you put them, you stored them in your closet in a cloth bag. And you uh, you uh, used uh, saddle soap on them, and you really cared for these because they were investment pieces. Um, as Europe recovered from World War II, we have our very first designer handbag or status handbag creator, and it was a woman in Italy named Roberta De Camerino. And Roberta handbags became a very coveted thing long before. Gucci and Chanel and Vuitton and um, all of those. A Roberta bag was the dream. And I can remember Neiman Marcus had a whole section of Roberta bags. And they all had this very distinctive R on them. So these were very, very big in the primarily, you know, Europe had to recover from the war. So let's say from 1950 forward is really when Roberta uh, came into the forefront. And Stanley Marcus, um, was one of the ones that helped bring her to the U.S. because he found her in Italy and um, saw what she did and helped, was one of the ones that brought her, he brought her uh, handbags to Dallas. And so that became something that uh, was um, very, very desirable among Dallas women. Um, and then, you know, today you still see some of these shapes. You know, this, if you look, you know, this almost goes back to uh, some of the, the Grace Kelly handbag and some of those from earlier, they're just they're just big. You know, if we're at a point now. I haven't done this talk in several years, and one of the things that is interesting is as we get a cell phone that does more and more stuff. You know, we're almost going the other way now with our handbags, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be interesting. I think we're at a point where, in in terms of the long view of fashion history. I think we're about to flip it and start back. Uh, and I think that's going to be fascinating to see. Because uh, you, now you see a little bit of everything, you know. And um, we got a lot of stuff still to put in there. <laughs> we still do. Yeah. Some of us do too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you look at that and you go, yeah, I've got keys. You know, now we're driving cars. You've got to have your car keys. You've got to have your house, house keys. Keys to whatever, who knows whatever. I've got keys on my key that I have absolutely no idea what they are. But not only do you have a key, but you've got the fob now to use to start your car and unlock your car. You know, you, you, you've got just all these crazy things that are just on a ring of keys anymore. Um, you've got, uh, you know, allergies. Medications. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, may, you may have a little, bit of, little bottle of hand lotion in your bag. Hand sanitizer. Hands, <laughs> hand sanitizer these days, absolutely. See, that's a new thing you've got on there. Got to have power cord, you know, or something to be able to charge your phone. So, so you still need a purse for a lot of things, right? And I, and I love this too. This was always something that it was a great phrase. I thought to <laughs> there's still value in a handbag. So, having a little fun, you know, looking at your bags. Who's got any of these things in it? You know, we can always say Walmart, grocery or Walmart receipts. Lipsticks. I know. One, I did 
did this talk for the Rotary Club several years ago, and I remember we had one woman that I think she had 16 lipsticks in her purse. She said, I just keep putting them in and I get to take them out. You know, measuring tape, screwdrivers, tools. I mean, you know, these are some of these are things we probably, you're all like, if you don't have it down in now, you probably have had it. Bottle of water, you know, and that's something else we take in. So, just, you know, it's kind of some fun things to think about in all of it. So, I hope that's entertained you and educated you a little bit, and let's go look at purses. Woo! Awesome. You've got a bottle of water with you. Oh, you've got your book! Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so enjoy, and I hope you all enjoy the exhibit up front.